This is Casey McBride with the National Crime Syndicate.com. Uh, welcome to Uncle Frank's Place. Uh, you can find me at frankcostellohistory.com and also at Uncle Frank's Place on Facebook. Uh, with me tonight, as always, we've got uh, my co-host and partner in crime, Mr. Mike Mafucci. How are you doing tonight, Mike? Very good, Casey. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Uh, thanks for taking the time to do this, as always. Um, and I want to say congratulations to you. Uh, you have a new column at the National Crime Syndicate coming out. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I had been asked a few times, but um, never really had much time for her. At least I didn't think I did. But uh, this time I, I agreed because I had some ideas running through my head. And uh, yeah, I'm going to do a weekly column um, coming out every Sunday. And it's basically going to be about, I don't want to say alternate ideas of what has gone on in mob history, um, but maybe things that people don't hear about very often and maybe not popular um, beliefs uh, that are out there, and I'm going to bring them up front and let people decide for themselves uh, what they think. You know, some people hate it, but some people might really get a kick out of it because it's not going to be the same stuff that we hear about every day. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. And I, uh, it's going to be called Dial M for Mob, for those uh, who are going to be looking for it, and it's at the nationalcrimesyndicate.com. But uh, I like your idea of being able to talk about, you know, theories and possibilities. Some of these guys get so wrapped up in it, it's just got to be the facts of what it is. But part of the fun of it for, for me is to just kind of talk about things like, you know, probabilities and alternate theories. And uh, everybody's got their own take on this, and uh, I think that's what makes it interesting. So I'm looking forward to 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 your column, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, so with us tonight, uh, we are very excited to have this guy with us. Um, you know, this is Uncle Frank's place. This is where we like to talk about all things that are Frank Costello. And if you're going to talk about Frank Costello, you can't have a conversation without bringing up this guy, uh, Vincent the Chin Giganti. And we have with us tonight the author of the book on the chin. We've got Larry McShane with us. How are you doing tonight, Larry? Great, great, Casey. Thanks for having me. You too, Mike. Hey, Larry. Oh, yeah. Well, we're real excited uh, to have you. Um, why don't you start off by kind of telling us just a little bit about your background, uh, uh, about what you're doing now, and sort of how you got into this whole crazy business? Yeah, sure. I, I came out of college in, uh, in 1980 and started working over in the city, uh, which if you had any sort of interest in the mob, uh, was, was kind of the perfect time. It was the arrival of Giuliani as the uh, prosecutor in the Southern District in Manhattan, uh, you know, followed by the commission trial. Uh, then things kind of moved to the Eastern District with Gotti and, uh, and Chin Giganti being prosecuted out there. Uh, there was just a ton of things going on at that time in, in organized crime, and uh, it was really kind of front and center. My, my interest in it sort of dates back to when I was a kid, um, my dad used to bring the Daily News home every night, and, uh, you know, I'd open up the paper and read these these stories about these guys with these great nicknames, and, uh, you know, it just really, even as a kid, kind of mesmerized me. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, and now you're you're writing for the, the Daily News now, right? Yeah, I'm writing for the Daily News now. Uh, I've been there for the last 10 years, and... Uh, you know, I still do some mob stuff there, not as much as I once did. And, uh, you know, the Giganti book came out a couple of years ago, and then I followed that up with uh, with another book on a guy named Ralph Natale, who was the uh, head of the Philadelphia mob. Right, yeah, I saw um, your uh, speaking engagement. I wasn't there, but they, they posted it online when you were at the Mob Museum talking about that. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit, too. But um one of the things I wanted to kind of just bring up and, and say to you before we get going is, uh, and I think Mike feels the same way about this, uh, you know, for being a, a guy that's out there doing this for a living and also, you know, you're, you're a legitimate author, you're writing the books, you're out there doing these tours and stuff, but you always take the time to kind of come on these groups and make comments and kind of mingle with the people who read your books. I think that's awesome because not everybody does that. Um, and I, it wasn't that long ago. I can't remember if it was with the Merlino trial or a, a couple of Genovese guys got busted. They were in court, but like you were right there, and then you were 
you know, getting on and posting it as it was sort of <laughs> happening. I thought that was the coolest thing. I mean, we, we were getting, you know, the news from somebody who was actually there in real time. So um, I hope you keep doing that because it, it's, it's really cool for guys like us, you know, to be able to mean well, I mean, talk it, with it's you guys. Kinda, it's kind of great. It's the Internet, right? Uh, real yeah. time stuff. And uh, I have to say people, you know, people like yourself and other people have really been uh, – very generous with their time and reaching out to show me things that I wouldn't otherwise see, you know? Yeah. It's, um, it's a new one for sure. And it's kind of, you know, interesting to see how it's, it's playing out and who's going to use this to the best, uh, of the ability. And, you know, it's a great tool if you use it correctly, I think. So it, it's good to see guys like you and, and I think Gary Jenkins is, uh, and Christian Cipollini and other guys that kind of get out there and, and they, they talk with us guys or fans. And it's it's exciting for us, so that's awesome. Um, well, thanks. But, I, I I enjoy the back and forth myself, so it's it's great from the other side too. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Um, so why don't we get into it here? Uh, can you just kind of give us a little bit of a give us a little bit of background, sort of an overview of who the Chin was for you know for people that are listening to this that might not know who he is and and why he has anything to do with Frank Costello. Just kind of give us a little bit of a, a history of the man. Yeah, uh, Vincent Giganti, known as the Chin, a nickname given to him uh, by his mother, kind of an Italian version, shorter version of his name, Vincent. She called him Chinzino, uh, which stuck. Uh, he came uh, growing up in, in Greenwich Village. He kind of came and fell under the sway of uh, Vito Genovese, uh, worked his way up through the Genovese family, Uh, His sort of biggest claim to fame before he really ascended the ladder uh, was the botched hit on Frank Costello. He was uh, was the gunman in the lobby there on Central Park West, you know, who spoke before he shot. (laughs) Uh, And, and, you know, that was – that became a huge story. When I went back and did did the research and went through clips and stuff, you know, the New York Times – the Daily News, the Post were running huge stories on this. There was a manhunt for him. Uh, now there's some discussion back and forth. He went to jail shortly after the botched Costello hit. Uh, he and Vito Genovese were uh, indicted together as uh, heroin runners, selling heroin. Uh, they were convicted. They both went to jail. Giganti went to his grave. Uh, denying that that he had any involvement in drugs, and uh, there was a lot of talk that this was all a setup, and it was arranged by the people who were friends of Costello as a little payback for their attempt to uh, to kill him. Uh, Giganti gets out of jail in the '60s, moves up the ranks fairly quickly, and by the early '80s, he's taken over as head of the family from Fat Tony Salerno. And uh, at this point, his his main claim to fame emerges, which is he comes up with a a racket to avoid prosecution, indictment, arrest. Uh, He pretends to be a mental patient, and he checks himself into a mental health facility for two weeks every year. Uh, He wanders around the streets of Greenwich Village in a bathrobe and slippers. Uh, And this actually keeps him out of jail until 1997. Uh, when he's convicted wow. of racketeering, and that's uh, that's kind of the beginning of the end for him. He later admits in court to the whole dodge that uh, that he was never mentally ill, and this was all an attempt to avoid prosecution. Uh, it's a plea bargain deal, and uh, he ends up dying in prison. But it's uh, the whole mental health aspect of it uh, is really extraordinary, I think, in the annals of crime and. Uh, you know, we're talking about a guy that never finished high school. For him to come up with something like this, he went before, uh, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say, a dozen psychiatrists and convinced them all that he was mentally unbalanced. And then wow. he would go to, the, go to the Triangle Civic Improvement Association on Sullivan Street, his headquarters, and run the Genovese family. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's such a crazy story. I mean, it's just it's not anything that you could make up, um, you know. And as far as two mob bosses, at least on the outside, 
you couldn't get two different people from like then Frank Costello and the, you know the chin. Right. You got one guy in the bathrobe, and you got one guy that's just Mister Uptown, always looking sharp. You know, he would never be seen like that in public. But uh, polar opposites. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's funny. That, that might have been the only time. That might have been the only time Giganti ever got up to the Upper West Side. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I actually I tried to get into that lobby when I was in New York just to, to kind of get a picture, and the, the doorman wasn't having it. He wouldn't let me in. <laughs> so, um, I got the impression that I'm not the first one who's asked to. I think he, he you know, every once in a while he gets somebody who who does. But um, yeah, well that's fascinating. Now, in your personal opinion about the the the, the drug bust, uh, do you think they were set up, or do you think it was they just got caught? From you know, they were obviously on the radar, so it's not like they were people that the cops didn't know who they were. So you know, I've always been kind of curious. What do you? What's your opinion on that? Well, this is why I would lean more towards towards setup. Um, the guy who uh, points the finger at him is a guy named Nelson Cantaloupes, I believe, and uh, he's basically kind of a low-level drug dealer. So it's kind of hard to believe that a guy selling drugs on the street would actually have any sort of entree with the head of the Genovese crime family, you know, Vito Genovese at that point. Sure. Um, you know, those, as you guys well know, I mean, those guys are, are pretty careful about keeping, keeping themselves insulated. You know, there's a few levels between guys on the street and the guy at the top of the food chain. So that's why I always sort of lean towards a setup. And it, it kind of makes sense too. a little bit of payback, right? Yeah, sure. Makes sense. Sure. Uh, my take on that's always been, you know, cause I, I don't know. Obviously, I wasn't there, so I'll, I'll teeter back and forth in what I, I believe from time to time. But I, it always, I just find it kind of hard to believe that, like, would, why would they set them up? It, it just seems so dangerous. It's like you're swatting a hornet's nest instead of just, you know, burning it down. You're leaving these guys alive in jail, mad at you <laughs> to, to strike back if if they wanted. Because um, I know Frank was always worried, you know, after he kind of stepped down. He, I think he was aware that like with Appalachian and, and things like this, like no matter what happened, he was probably going to get blamed for it, or at least be under suspicion that he was trying right. to get back at him and stuff. So, but, uh, you know, I think it's all part of what makes it it's such an interesting story between the, the two. Um, what's your opinion on the kind of the theory that the chin missed on purpose, that it, the whole thing was set up? And they never really meant to to get rid of. Them I mean, in the first I, place. I've I've always thought that's kind of interesting too. I I don't know whether it's true or not. The the thing that I always that always struck me as funny, and I I saw more about this when I was digging around a little bit, is that uh, you know Costello apparently held no sort of grudge towards Giganti. He he refused to identify him in court from the witness stand, and then after Giganti got out of prison several years later, they were at the same dinner party at a place in Greenwich Village. Right. Yeah, I was going so, to ask you I mean, about it, that. Yeah, it's just kind of, uh, well, that's that's really old school, isn't it? That that it's uh, so, it, it's, it's just business. business. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just so it's so hard for me to believe sometimes though that you know you have guys that uh, with the egos that they have and and the tempers that you know well could they really hold it back enough to just put that on the back burner and 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 move on? But you know, I think. Uh, some of these guys at the top, what you know, what set them apart was that they could control their emotions and kind of see the big picture. And you know, I think for Costello, he definitely felt probably fortunate that he got out of that alive at all. So, you know, why rock the boat at that point? I mean, he was he was rich and happy, and uh, kind of out of the biz at that point, which I think he'd been kind of fed up with it for a while. <laughs> so, you know, I think he was glad to get out. Yeah, I think the timing, as it turned out, was perfect. Right? Absolutely. Sure. You know, yeah, I think um, he was fairly tight with Anastasia, who was killed a few months later, too, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of times people get that kind of mixed up in the history. They they, they sort of think that Anastasia was, was hit first, and then they right. went after Costello. But, you know, it was it was a couple months between the two. And uh, I know with Willie Moretti, too, that kind of gets lumped in where they're like, Genovese was making a move to get rid of some of Costello's muscle. But, you know, that was, I think it was, five or six years in between. So, you know, it, uh, you never know. I don't know if they were related or not, but uh, it just, it makes for good conjecture for shows like this later on and we can talk about it. So, yeah, I mean, but, here we are 55 or 60 years later, right? <laughs> still, 
still talking about it, man. There's, yeah. And there's still lots of people who are interested. You know, we're not the only ones. So it's great. Um, hey, one thing I also kind of wanted to, to ask you a little bit about it was another book that you've done, uh, The Cops Under Fire. Um, I, I'm kind of one of those guys that maybe a rarity in some of these groups. Like I find the cop stories fascinating myself. And I think some of those guys like Joe Petrozino and Joe Coffey, um, Bill Owsley, Gary Jenkins, these guys that, you know, are mob cops. I think uh, that whole story is just as interesting. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about that book? Yeah, actually, that was a, not a mob book. Um, right. That was, a, that was a book about uh, what happens to police officers who are charged with crimes allegedly committed on duty. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a cop in Brooklyn who was accused of being part of a drug gang, and I covered his trial and, and wrote about that. He, w- he wound up being acquitted. Uh, a, a cop in Newark who got in a, uh, tried to make an arrest got dragged by a car driven by a crackhead, shot and killed the woman who was behind the wheel. And it just sort of looked at what happens to these guys. Uh, the, the cases I focused on were cases where guys were acquitted. And... Uh, you know, there's there's a very much an initial backlash, I think, against the cops, or at least there was in the case that, cases that I wrote about. And so it just sort of looked at these cases, how they started out, what the immediate repercussions were, and then eventually, uh, you know, what happened when they were acquitted. Right. I mean, it's a tough gig. I, you know, I don't think it's gotten any easier today. It's, you know, everywhere you look, it's there's a real... You know, in certain areas, just anti-cop, this and that. Um, I'm not a cop myself. I, I have a lot of relatives and stuff who are, so I've kind of grown up around it. But uh, right. it, it's just, you know, it's a job. I just, I can't wrap my head around. I can't even imagine anybody who would want to do it. Um, but, you know, I always, you know, it's good to see when people kind of write books a little bit about their perspective and what they're going through, because I don't think a lot of people give them the credit for what they do. Yeah, it was interesting. uh for me to talk to, uh, I remember there was a case in Nebraska, you know, I, I know the cops around here, but it was, it was interesting to talk to cops from around the country and get a little bit of a different perspective than just, you know, pretty much the NYPD is what I write about. So Sure. That's awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit about your experience at the Mob Museum uh, when you were speaking about your other book. Um, and tell us a little bit about that book, too, because that's a pretty interesting story, how you got involved with that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning when we were talking, I've really spent all my time, you know, working up in New York. I live across the river in New Jersey. Uh, and I'm I'm very familiar with New York organized crime, but... Uh, not so much with Philadelphia. Uh, and this, this opportunity kind of fell in my lap to work with Ralph Natale, uh, who was one of uh, Angelo Bruno's kind of top guys. Uh, he's got an interesting story because he, uh, he got arrested. And we, were, we were talking about old school guys. He refused to, uh, to implicate anybody. He was called before a, a congressional subcommittee question uh, by U.S. senators and refused to give an inch. And uh, he wound up doing, I want to see if I get these numbers right, I think 17 years in prison the first time. And uh, then he came back and he took over. He spent 17 years in prison, not speaking, came back to Philadelphia, became the boss, and was free for 44 months. And then he went back to jail. Wow. Uh, he got he got busted. You know, I, it was funny because, I mean, he went to jail in 79, I think. And when he came out, he really had no idea of uh, the advances in, in electronic surveillance and wiretapping. Right. And the FBI, the FBI had, you know, he used to hang out at a racetrack down across the river from Philadelphia. And uh, they had his table at the racetrack wired. Uh, they had his whole condo wired. They had his phones tapped. And uh, like I said, not even four years, and uh, he was arrested again. Wow. They, now, see, yeah. they should offer old school mob guys when they get out of prison, they should be given like a class that teaches them about new. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like yes, exactly. Welcome to don't the new tweet, millennium. Don't email, don't say anything, you know. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> yeah. But uh, so, but you you got to meet him and and interview him for this book. Is that correct? Uh, it, just funny that you ask. I, I spoke to him today because tomorrow's his birthday. <laughs> oh, wow. we're still in touch. Yeah. He's wow. going to be eighty-three so, tomorrow. So, what's that like talking to a guy who? I mean, he was legitimately kind of the boss of the family. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, I mean, it, it's funny because you know I drove down to meet him and uh, you know I did some research about him, but I didn't I didn't really have any idea of you know who he was or what he looked like. And, you know, right? It's just this. You know, that really a, a little, little old Italian guy. You know, I think he was seventy nine when I first met him, seventy nine, eighty. Uh, and and so we go in, and I turn the tape recorder, and then he he, he tells me this this incredible story about going out on a Christmas night, leaving his family at home around the tree, and putting three bullets in the back of some guy's head. <laughs> Oh, and it was just kind of like, whoa, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then you remember uh, who you're talking to, you know what I mean? It, it's so, yeah, right. well, so yeah, it's kind strange. of like, by way of introduction, let me tell you this story, you know? <laughs> uh, wow. Which actually, I, it's the beginning of the book. It was it was just such an incredible story that uh, that's how the book starts. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, did but you get I, any sense of, re- of regrets from him? Talking to him, like you he know, said. Uh, I, I mean, I asked him this, and he said the only regret he had in life was that he had cheated on his wife. Yeah. Wow. That's it. Nothing else. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Man. He's he's uh, like I said, he's going to be 83. He lifts weights uh, and runs every morning, uh, which is a habit he got into when he was in prison. Wow. That's, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean. Um, you know, not many people, I guess, get to say they've had that experience. Like you, you get to talk to this guy, and you can, you don't, you'll have that forever. That's pretty cool, man. Uh, yeah, how did you? Get yeah, we're, that? we're we're kind of friendly, you know. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> um, did now, how did you get into that book? Was that something that you decided you wanted to write, or did you get like hired to write that story from? Yeah, I, my, some, what I was told was that he had been working on a book with somebody else, and uh, I don't know, they had some sort of a falling out, and. Uh, the guy who was my agent on the Chin book asked if I would be interested in doing it, and I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to do it. So it, it nice. just kind of fell in my lap. I was very fortunate. Great opportunity. Uh, how about the Chin book? Was that your kind of doing to get that one going, or was that sort of the same situation? No, that was uh, – it took me a long time to, to find somebody who would be interested in that book. Uh, I probably started working on it like 2005 maybe, right after oh, the wow. Chin died. Wow. Uh, and the book didn't come out until 2015. So, uh, but the good thing about that one is I had covered uh, quite a bit of the stuff that went on with Giganti. I was at, uh, I was in court uh, when Sammy Gravano testified against him. So I was there for that, which was quite a scene. Uh, I was there uh, in 2000, 2003 when he copped the plea and uh, and admitted that the whole thing was a ruse. And uh, I had collected tons of court documents, and I also, after he died, foiled the FBI, but also the Bureau of Prisons. And the Bureau of Prisons stuff, they sent me a box full of stuff, was just uh, a real treasure trove of stuff. You know, uh, for example, he went uh, to Lewisburg when he went to prison in the early 60s, and they had a copy of his original uh, entry interview. You know, wow. he talked about, you know, he went to church every Sunday and he was a married guy and, uh, you know, his kids. And, and, and I, I just found the whole thing very riveting. Uh, I'll, I'll yeah. bet I got 4,000 pages of stuff from the Bureau of Prisons, which which was really, uh, a lot of it was new. It was new to me and I think it was new to people who read it. And, uh, I, I, I mean, I just thought it was a great, great, gave me great insights into it. I bet. Um, I, man, I... It's so hard for somebody like me, uh, I'm, I probably don't want to speak for Mike, but probably too, you know, anybody that's got any kind of interest in this thing, I just find it amazing that you had a hard time getting somebody interested in that book. You know, like yeah. out of all the people to write about, it's like there's so much there. And like we said, the story is so crazy. Like how could somebody not just jump on that, you know, and sure. go like, yeah. A character, character like him, I mean, that should be yeah. a movie. Yeah, I mean, we didn't even get into the fact that, you know, he had a wife and a mistress simultaneously for like 30 years. With the same name. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Olymp- the, the FBI called his wife Olympia One and his mistress Olympia Two. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, there, there was just so much. Uh, I was sort of surprised when I first started thinking about doing it that nobody had done one yet, you know? Yeah, that's what I, I – like, how are there not ten books on him already? That's what I don't understand, you know? It's, I would think that there would have been things coming out instantly. Um, like, when I look at – I've got a bunch of books on Frank Costello, and almost all of them – were written right around 1973 or 75, like right after he died. Like a bunch right, of people, right. you know, just put all these books out, and then there really hasn't been anything until, you know, Tony stuff and I was going to put one out. But, it, you know, that's decades in between. But I, it, there's at least there's three or four of them that are out there that exist. I can't believe that there's not more, you know. But that's good for you. You know, great. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what, it really was uh, fortunate, wasn't it? Yeah, that's cool. Um, the other so, thing that was good was that there was a, a you know, an editor at uh, Kensington Books, which put the book out, uh, who was a bit of a mob aficionado, and and he got really excited right away when when he was approached. So that was a huge help as well. I bet. I mean, like, yeah, like it seems like if you got anybody who was even remotely interested in this, like they'd be like, yes, put this book right. out, of course, let's go. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, now, was the research tough? Because, you know, Chin was so quiet and secretive. Uh, it was, might have been really hard to get information. Yeah, again, the the, the FBI documents uh, kind of went back to the 50s, so I got a lot of stuff there. Uh, the Daily News, you know, they call it the morgue, where they keep all the old clips. I spent probably two days going through, you know, the... the <laughs> There's no stuff in a database going through like old yellow newspaper clips. Wow. Uh, which had which had tons of stuff, so I was fortunate to have access to that. Uh and like I said, the uh the prison documents just had a ton of stuff in there. Uh th- there's a lot of great detail just just to pick out one sort of odd thing about his death in prison and like, you know, Guard comes by at 1.50 a.m., he's fine. You know, 3.50 a.m., somebody comes by, he's on the floor in the place, you know. And it also had a lot of detail about, you know, we were, we were kind of talking before about the wife and the mistress. After he died, there was a, a bit of a feud between the wife and, and that family and the mistress and that family <laughs> over who was going to be handling the funeral arrangements. Wow. Uh, when, when he died, he was cremated, and they they had to agree to divide the ashes. Oh, wow. Uh, so half the ashes went to uh, to the wife and her family in Old Japan, New Jersey, and the other half went to his mistress on the Upper East Side. Yeah, so that story just gets crazier and crazier, even after he's gone. It's yeah, still, exactly. you know, There's yeah. nothing normal about it at all. It's, it's incredible. Um, uh, let me ask you this. What, what do you think? kind of from your research or what you've read about him, um, what do you think his, his feelings were towards Costello? Do you think like there was animosity, like he, he didn't like that old guard um, of boss, uh, you know, or do you think that he just went along with, you know, the hit that was just part of the part of his job, part of his business, didn't probably care one way or another? Yeah, he had, he had previously been identified in FBI documents as a hitman uh, for, for Vito Genovese. And uh, you know, I think to him, yeah, it was probably just uh, just a job, right? Maybe maybe the biggest job he ever had. Uh, sure. Certainly, certainly the biggest target. But no, I don't. There's no indication that, and and no reason I can think of why he and Frank Costello would be moving in the same circles. You know, he was. Uh, yeah. You know, he was at that point still kind of, you know, soldier for lack of a better term, but kind of a low level guy. He still lived in the village. Uh, you know, you obviously, you guys know, you know, Frank Costello lived a way different lifestyle than that. Right. Yeah. Um, how, wh- why do you think it is like, how did he get away with botching the hit and not suffer any consequences? You know, you always hear people like, well, he should have been, you know, hit himself because he botched this or he botched that. Well, what's your take on that? Well, he did hide himself. This is actually kind of a, a funny story. He, uh, he apparently had gotten uh, very big, heavy, before the hit. And uh, they took him and they hit him upstate, and they put him on like a crash diet <laughs> so, that when he, so that when he turned himself in, 
he was a much thinner guy, and the hope was, of course, that this would make it uh, harder to identify him. Right. Yeah, there's uh, so, a. Yeah, oh, I was gonna say there's there one of those police sketches of him that you know that came from the uh, the description of the doorman that, there that was right. there when they hit down and he looks like John Candy or something. <laughs> yeah, he's just a exactly huge right. guy. You know, <laughs> you see the pictures of him later. He's just he's much more. He's just kind of a tall, slender dude. But um, well, he looks like he did in the days when he was a fighter, as opposed to you know when he right. looked like the days he spent as an eater. You know. <laughs> sure. So you actually, so when you were at these court things, you 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 saw him in person, like you've actually seen him. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Although I, you know, it's not like. I mean, one of the, I was going to say great things. I, maybe I, I should say interesting things. To me was, he would be in a, you know, in a courtroom full of people with a prosecutor and a judge and a jury, and uh, he very rarely would break character. You know, he he sat at the defense table, uh, never said a word, kind of staring into the distance. Um, you know, I, one of the prosecutors in, in the racketeering case where he was convicted, among his many ailments, Giganti said he had a, a tremor in his, I think it was his left leg. And uh, the prosecutor looked over at the table and uh, Giganti was shaking his right leg. <laughs> and uh, the prosecutor said to him, Chin, it's the left leg. And, and he said, Giganti never reacted, but just started shaking the left leg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, now he's amazing to me. It's just he just doesn't look, you know, uh, like the kind of guy who is as smart as he was. He's just so good at kind of giving a facade of somebody that wasn't as cunning as as he was. But he was a, he was a sharp guy. I mean, he was, you know, head of that family for a lot of years in a really difficult time too, because, you know, they, with the surveillance and all the technology and all the RICO right. laws, that was not a good time to be a, a, a mob boss. You know, those were the, the hard days. And he, you know, from what I understand, he kept them guessing over and over. And they all said he was very difficult to get information on and to follow and all that kind of stuff. So, well, you know, I mean, he, he had a couple of things going for him. One thing was that uh, the guys in his family, were extremely loyal to him. Uh, there weren't many, the, you know, the, the Genovese family did not have many informants. They had some, you know, some hard guys like, like Bobby Manna uh, or Benny Eggs Mangano, you know, guys that went to prison. And uh, Benny just died last year, but uh, Bobby Manna is still in prison. You know, guys who went to prison rather than, than rat chin out. Right. Uh, the head of the uh, FBI's Genovese squad at the time said they considered trying to do, uh, you know, a Donnie Brasco and try and get somebody inside the family, and they just, you know, very quickly realized it would be impossible to do that. Never uh, the happen. second thing that he sort of had going for him is by being in Greenwich Village where he'd spent his whole life, and this will sound a little crazy, but it's, it's definitely true, he had the support of the people in the community. Sure. Uh, you know, there's kind of a famous story where the FBI built a shed on a building down on Sullivan Street uh, across from his social club so that they could have a guy up there just taking pictures, you know, pretty standard procedure, right? Who comes in, who comes out? Uh, they put it up one day, and they came back the next day, and it had been smashed to pieces. <laughs> wow. Know? So, yeah, so he, he had the loyalty of, of both, you know, the guys in the family and the guys in the neighborhood. Yeah. I know, from what I understand, too, you know, other families, he was pretty feared. He was not uh, a guy to be trifled with from, you know, from what I've heard. So, but he's just, yeah, he's a fascinating character. Um, so Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I heard from more than one person that uh, John Gotti really believed, uh, you know, Giganti, of course, took great offense to the cat Paul Castellano hit, uh, you know, because he's a sitting boss, and it's not good for a sitting boss to watch another sure. sitting boss get killed without anybody getting any any sort of approval. Right. And uh, Gotti, I was told by more than one person, was really, you know, terrified that Giganti was going to have him killed. Yeah, I've, just, I've heard Just on a side things. note here, I was there uh, at the scene covering the story when uh, on the night when Castellano got, got killed. 
That's right. That's something I wanted to ask you about because I heard you mention this uh, in something else. So, so you were there that night. Like, tell us about that. That's crazy. Yeah, well, I'm working. I'm working uh, in Rockefeller Center at the time for the Associated Press, and uh, we uh, we get a, we hear a report from the NYPD that two guys are shot on 40, East 46th Street there. And then our guy in the courthouse calls, you know, Castellano was about to go on trial down there, and said they're hearing at the court that uh, that Castellano has been shot in, in Midtown Manhattan. So uh, I actually I said this when I spoke in Las Vegas. I ran from my office, which you know, if you saw me now, I was in much better shape back then. <laughs> and uh, it was it was really like uh, like a movie. A movie set because they had the big, uh, the big fluorescent lights like lighting up the street, right? And uh, you know the the car is parked against the curb and uh, the driver Tommy Bellotti is laying out on the street on one side, and on the other side there's there's Castellano laying in the street and there's you know rivers of blood. I mean it looked like again like a movie set except you know this had really just happened 20 minutes earlier. Wow. Uh, it was, it was, uh, I mean, that, that probably more than anything got me, you know, professionally really interested in, in covering the mob. Just the, the chance, random chance that I was there that night when the shooting happened and I got sent over to the crime scene. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I'm, I live on the West Coast, uh, and I remember when that happened. It was even on the news out here. And, you know, that was probably yeah. one of my first memories that I have of ever seeing something you know, mob related that was real life that was on the news. And then it wasn't too long after that, you know, I started seeing all the headlines with Gotti and things yep. like that. But I think that's the first thing that I can, you know, probably legitimately remember of like, wow, it, it was huge news. Um, and, and yet, wow. And you were there. I mean, that's something you're never going to forget. Uh, did you ever come yeah. across Joe Coffey? Like, covering stuff like did you ever see him on crime scenes or anything like that i never saw him on crime scenes of course i i spoken to him on the phone for different stories he's a he's a really good uh you know resource and very helpful oh, well wow. so you've talked you talked to him that's kind of cool <laughs> I yeah think he's, he's you know to me again he's one of the more interesting guys in this history he's, he's having watched so many mob documentaries and he's always on there you know just yes, bluster in and go to guy right <laughs> <laughs> well yeah and he's he's always so entertaining too you know he plays that part really well and he doesn't make any bones about the way he feels so he's he's good on tv and good for quotes and stuff like that so i really i kind of miss that i wish he was still around but so that's pretty cool too you you talked to him man you you've been around that's that's awesome yeah <laughs> So uh, we got a little bit of time left here. Uh, I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on uh, what's it like speaking at the Mob Museum. How was that experience for you? Uh, well, of course, you know, I'll start out by saying you got to speak for like 50 minutes, which I had never done before. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like I flew out to Las Vegas and I spent a whole day in my hotel room working on what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but, but the museum itself is is uh, terrific. Uh, my wife and I had actually been out there a few years ago and went. Uh, we both really liked it. Uh, they've they've improved it since then. There's a lot of new stuff. Uh, the exhibits are great, and uh, they have the speakers come in. A, they, they've built like a replica courtroom. Right. So you go in and you appear in the courtroom and speak to the people. And uh, they had a pretty good crowd. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. We did a Q and A after and. Uh, I thought all the questions were pretty good. Uh, the people seemed to be really interested, and uh, and they had very specific things they wanted to know about. So I, for me, it was a great experience. Uh, I had a great time out there. The people were nice, and uh, the people who showed up, uh, like I said, were very well informed, and they paid attention, and they seemed really interested in the subject. Right. I think they've got a pretty good uh, regular crowd that, that goes to those, and like you said, they are, you know, they're people who are, who are interested in this this history, so you know that's good and bad because they know what they're talking about when you got yeah. in front of them. So, but um, yeah, yeah. I, like I said, I watched it. They broadcast it, uh, and I, I thought it was really good. And you, you could probably go on the Mob website. I imagine it's probably still on there for people who haven't seen it. You can go back and kind of look at their live things that they've recorded. So I definitely recommend it. It was 
it was a, a good a good speaking uh, engagement. But um, oh, well, thank you. It was it was fun to do when it was all over, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, so, what do you got coming up in the future? Like, what what uh, what are your plans? Do you have any projects coming up? I don't know. Uh, there's been some talk about different things, but nothing nothing really solid. I was just uh, uh, PBS did a documentary on Harvey Weinstein. Right, and I, I did a little talking head stuff for them in that. So, uh, oh wow, <laughs> yeah. The uh, I was um, involved. I don't know if you recall a few years back, there was an Italian actress who claimed that she was groped by Weinstein. Uh, the NYPD really pressed for uh, for charges in the case, and the Manhattan DA uh, declined to bring charges, uh, which created a bit of a stir when it first happened, but not as much as you know last year when everybody came out and right. it became pretty clear that uh, her allegations were probably entirely accurate. So um, so I was on and spoke a little bit about that, which was fun. Well, cool, man. Um, where can people go? Like, Do you have like a website or anything that you recommend people go to, to find your books or, you know, kind of keep up on what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, the, the books are, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any place like sure. that. Uh I would always recommend a bookstore. I'm a big fan of the bookstores. Nice. Uh, yeah, but uh, no, I don't have a website or anything. My stuff is, uh, you know, dailynews.com, writing for the New York Daily News on all sorts of stuff. Uh, right. A lot of crime stuff. Um, like we were talking about before, I, I, you know, just did a story about Chin Giganti's uh, son with the mistress. Uh, he was arrested in January. Uh, and it's funny, Chin was a guy who kind of famously chided uh, John Gotti for bringing Junior Gotti into organized crime. Right. And uh, as it turns out now, uh, one son from his legitimate family and one son from his illegitimate family wow. uh, have been arrested on mob charges. So, mm. uh, yeah, kind of an interesting it, – it's an interesting to me postscript to his life that, you know, I, I yeah. don't know – I don't know about the the illegitimate kid, but but his his other son uh, was indicted with him uh, and pleaded guilty the same day that Chin did. Uh, the interesting thing about that is, at that you know, Giganti had never really spoken in court, had never uh, done anything but put on the act, and he had to stand up that day in front of a federal judge and admit to his crimes. Wow! And so he allocuted to. Uh, you know, read a written statement as as to what it was. And then the son was coming in right after him uh, to be sentenced. And Giganti made a request that, that uh, his son be allowed to come into the well of the courtroom uh, and sit with him. And so, you know, before he was led away and before the son came in for his sentencing, uh, father and son sat talking like any father and son would at the defense table in the federal courthouse in Brooklyn. Wow. Yeah. What a life, yeah. man. What a life. Uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty crazy stuff. Um, well, Larry, man, uh, can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to us about all this stuff. You know, as always, usually when we have a guest could have talked to you for another hour about all this, but, um, we really appreciate it. And anytime you got something uh, that you got to say or you got a book, something coming up, speaking engagement, let us know. We'll be happy to kind of put the word out there as best we can for you. Uh, I really appreciate that. Mike and Casey, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate that, too. You bet, Larry. Yeah. Thanks again. And, and have yourself a good night, my friend. All right. Stay in touch, fellas. Take care. You, you got too. It. Mike. Right. Good night, Bye -bye. guys. See you.